Uh, hello, this is actually a question for your panel. All right, so I noticed a couple of patterns in the organs that you all took tissues from, uh, brain, heart, uh, liver, kidney, they came up frequently. I wanted to know if this is a field standard. What, what is it about those particular organs that made you all choose them? So I'll answer for myself first, and then I'll look at some of my organs who was on the campus as well. Um, I started with those organs primarily because they are considered some of the filter organs. So the lung has very small capillary beds for oxygen and exchange there. Um, so things might get stuck in there. And then the liver and kidney are clear filter organs. They're designed to clean the blood. And so if there are things that shouldn't be in the blood, that seems like a good place to be able to look for them. Uh, the heart has a lot of turbulent flow associated with it. So it comes in, it settles for a moment, and then it's pumped back out. So kind of like riverbeds, where you see where the sandbars are. That turbulent flow often allows for the sand and riverbeds to fall out. It could also allow for some of these particles. Usually it's with our heavier particles, plastic seems unlikely to be coming out of that flow, but possible nonetheless. So liver, heart, kidney. And then in that sense, you also had brain tissue, I think. Yes. So understand the brain is like 13% of the body's blood flow or what fresh happened. So the last question I didn't hear was about the brain in particular, why we decided to look at the brain. And so for my studies, we looked at the brain because we'd already gone through one biological barrier. We'd already gone through the placenta. And so the next set of questions was about a second biological barrier, first of all. And secondly, I think arguably the brain is one of the most important organs in the body. So if I'm looking at these filter organs, expect to find them there. The brain will almost be our control. It really wasn't expecting that they would be necessarily in the brain. The fetal, I thought they might be in the fetal brain um, because the blood barrier is formed, yeah, it's formed during that gestational period that we have the exposure. Um, but the brain, of course, is, is vital. So we found them there that may have some traumatic health outcomes. So can do anything <coughs> And I noticed in your presentation, you didn't have uh, brain tissue amongst the ones you were showing. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, we did brain. Yeah. Um, and, and if you ask me a year and a half ago when we started this, uh, what was my conviction that we were 100% wrong? Uh, I would have thought that the liver would have been run of absorption from the gut, and that the brain would have been relatively protected given the blood brain barrier and its sort of unique status. Uh, totally wrong. Um, we're seeing different patterns of sizes in the brain. They tend to be a little bit bigger, wider, longer, uh, but a lot of overlap with the kidney and the liver. They, they, I think, to, to Dr. Stapleton's point, um, the, the liver and kidney are there to process it. They do know how to handle it and move them along, whether the liver is putting it back out in the bile or the gut, or the kidney is clearing things into the urine. Um, but the brain is not exceptional for clearance. Things get into it, don't get out. So we think that's part of the problem. Um, but to your other point, we are looking at other organ systems. We just have limited bandwidth. So you know, I can grab a, I can torture only so many graduate students with so many topics. And we do have somebody looking at lung. It, lungs seem to be on the order of what we see in the liver and kidney, not too different. We've done the testes. Uh, we're getting fresh consults from uh, ear, nose, and throat surgery. I'm not sure why. Because <laughs> I don't go into CDs or anything. I'm not associated with tonsils. But uh, they also seem to be around 200 to 300 micrograms per gram, like kidneys and liver. So um, we're, we're interested in broad distribution throughout the body. And once we have you know that information, we can move towards sort of the other layers, like how long does it stay there? Uh, then what diseases might it be associated with, how, what is in the diet that might be driving this. So all those important questions, we, we are anxious to get to, but we just have to take things you know, sort of one step at a time. Hi, thanks. I think this is mostly for the research panel, but um, in my job as a health officer, I get all kinds of questions and I'm called to interpret things. And I'm an expert in very few things. So 
When people think about hazards in the environment, I think a lot of us grew up thinking about the toxic chemicals, Aaron Brockovich, hexavalent chromium, things like that. And we know that the chemicals which make plastics have their toxicities. But if I'm understanding correctly, with, with PFAS and, and things which do not break down, they do not cause their harm through a chemical process, but through a biomechanical process by virtue of the, the shape and the fact that they, yeah, it, it's like if you try to drive down a street with a lot of plastic barriers in it, you'd have trouble getting through. And is that a good way to explain the uh, suspected hazards to human health from uh, micro nanoplastics? I think that's reasonable. Um, there might be chemical interactions with the surface of these particles. But in our, in the histological sections I shared, if, if you were a pathologist, you'd say, I don't see inflammation, I don't see disease. They just, there's a lot of particles there that shouldn't be. So we are sort of wondering, can this interfere with um, the, the flow of blood? Can it, can it interfere with clearance through lymphatics? Networking of neurons is a physical connection between neurons. Can these things get in the way? So there's a number of questions we have that, that sort of fall suit. Are they, are they physically obstructive? <clears throat> I used to study uh, hypoxia, like intermittent hypoxia that you get with sleep apnea. And I used to joke with my physiology friends, this is really the toxicity of nitrogen. You know, nitrogen is 70% of the atmosphere. It doesn't do anything to our bodies, but if you have more of it, it's displacing oxygen. So, so at some point, are we just displacing the, the parts of the brain that should be brain? Thanks. Well, it's, it's a little different how you can and how you pop it all. Uh, and we know a lot about what happened with particles at the molecular level, or cellular level, or organism level in the human level. So, um, I think I have time to show uh, that. So, at the cellular level, when, when these particles, these nanoplastics in particular, that they, they are kind of forbidden, they can enter into cells, they can interfere with cell function. Also, as they wander around in the environment, they can pick up, because of their extensive, extensive surface, other chemicals. Uh, and when they enter the cell, they can be kind of torture and force delivering the chemicals. And, and the particles themselves are not those uh, those nurdles that we saw earlier. They're jagged. They're they're angular. They can yeah things can easily get they can get hung up on things and vice versa. No, actually that's how they are. Through the degradation, that's how they become. Uh, they have edges. Uh, they're in the nanoscale. They have a probably make sure they have chemical corona on the surface, and then when they enter the cell, also they can even deliver PFOS and other additives that they have in there. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not just uh, particles are really different than chemicals uh, in a way. A, a particular uh, phase itself can also cause uh, a destruction of cells, can interfere, can generate reactive species. In the cell, we have time to show you. We, we have evidence that they can break the DNA uh, in, in, in the cell as well. They point to the electricity and the toxicity as well. So, uh, particles are really different. So, we need to differentiate between mixing of chemicals that we've been studying for quite some time for plastics. Uh, this is completely different. This is a, 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 a migrant plastic, it's a particular form. Uh, that it has the ability to bypass biological boundaries, especially when they are in the landscape. Um, and I think TV showed uh, the, from the lab and maybe to uh, all the way to the brain of the pipes, from the stomach and also maybe all the way to placenta and then to the, to the pipes. I think the scary part, I'm not surprised, uh, is uh, the brain. Uh, but, you know, again, nanoscale particles, they can even go through your factory now and, and maybe directly to the brain. We know, we, we know the things that can happen. Yeah, one of our co-residents had a question, he's too shy. Uh, so how do you guys define controls? So a great article, it's a pretty young researcher, way back in the day. And um, you know, she was finding these uh, particles, these forever particles or whatever, uh, uh, maybe it was a PFAS or PFAS or whatever, in her case. Uh, and uh, to prove her wrong, her manager said, go out, 
grab one of the horses or whatever uh, somewhere and see if you can find it uh, in their specimen. And she did, and so she was therefore disproven. Uh, years later, it kind of came out that actually that was a sign that maybe everyone should have been a little bit more scared. Um, so how do you guys find the controls for this? Um, you know, I can imagine it's sort of difficult. So I'll start with our controls as I move with my good to Matt, because he had uh, a list of presentation he gave yesterday, and he had a really interesting uh, take on how to do controls. So conveniently in our thank you, conveniently in our studies, we uh, use a lot of time model. And so of course there's that cross-contamination that you're referring to, or your colleagues are referring to. Our animals live in a polycarbonate housing. <coughs> the filter that's on top is definitely um, some type of HEPA filter, which is a plastic. And then God only knows what's in their feed and their bedding, those kinds of things. And the best part of the whole thing is that to have our animals um, not be bored while in the caging, they tend to give them neither bones to have something to chew. So that's really great when you're trying to study plastic research. But our one in particular uses a very specific plastic, so that we try to eliminate that. We, we understand that everybody's going to be exposed. So we use a very specific plastic that's not used in our laboratory setting or any of the other movements so that when we have our exposed group, we're looking for just that single particle and any of the toxicity that we're trying to control in our exposed group would be part of that, do that exposure of them. So that's how we try to mitigate it. But Matt had a really interesting temporal look at some of his human subjects and some of the animal work that they've done. Um. You, you're referring to my, my wild-caught critter study, or the... I'm referring to the 1960s, the, the museum study, I oh. think, the... So, so yeah, exactly. Our, these, these were wild-caught mice in a museum that we have over on our main campus at the University of New Mexico. They have 600,000 samples of mammalian tissue caught geographically dispersed around the globe and uh, back in time. And when we look at the kidneys from wild-caught mice up and down just the Rio Grande corridor, uh, we see that you have to go back to the 1970s to see zero plastics with this method. Um, that said, I mean, if anybody in here knows of a museum that has like human brains from like before 1960, I need that for analytical methods. Uh, I just need a negative control. <laughs> so please, let's, let's talk. I, I ask this at every meeting I go to now. I, I have a weird place in life. The Lunar Museum in Philadelphia. They've told me none. I figured they might. But they Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Thomas, environmental justice organizer with Iron Bound Community Corporation. I'm also a community member, I live in the Iron Bound. Um, I want to thank Oriana first for framing the plastic problem specifically within the context of EJ communities like the Iron Bound, like North, um, that has power plants, incinerators, sewage waste treatment facilities, super, super fun and brownfield sites, etc. My question for the researchers um, is, can you talk about any research on microplastics and their interactions with chemicals in the body or the chemicals that they're produced with? Because in EJ communities, we always stress the importance and the acknowledgement of cumulative impacts. You know, it's not just the incinerator and the sewage waste treatment site. It's those chemicals that are synergistically interacting with each other and compounding on each other. So I'm wondering, like in the context of microplastics, like do you see this cumulative impact problem? And um, you know, Dr. Philip talked about how microplastics are produced with industrial processes. Um, so we know those industrial processes are producing things like dioxin, like lead, like sulfur dioxide. So one of my questions is like, do microplastics have the ability to like store the contaminants that they're like released with? And then how does that then like affect the body's ability to or not to like process them and like break them down? It's a really intuitive question. Thank you very much. I know Dr. Bonpatrice has done some work with this, especially the inspiration components. Well, I, I think we know a lot about mixtures because in the real world we are exposed to mixtures of things. And in biology, uh, we sometimes have synergistic effects, so it's like one plus one, not necessarily is two, it can be three or four, and the other way around. So 
But we we have developed methods so that we can really study complex features. Uh, the source of portion is a little bit difficult to say, you know, in the area you have all kinds of chemicals and this contributes X percentage to this disease and X. so when we have the tools. Uh, I think the, the, the big challenge right now is exposure characterization. We don't know what's happening in the human population level and we need this data. We need this data because they will drive also the dog stock. You need to know the dose, the dose makes the poison. Uh, just the identification of the hazard, I think we have a lot of evidence and we know from biomarker studies that this matter of plastics are in the organ. That's good enough uh, for hazard identification and we know the chemicals and other things that they come along with the particles, uh, the bypass value of the virus, but the dose makes the poison. We really need to um, move to the next level. We have to have the exposure data the hazard characterization, and then if you put the two together, then you have the risk. So we need to be a little bit careful. Um, the fact that we find uh, migrant plastics in every organ, it doesn't necessarily mean it is I mean, it's very alarming, uh, but this a bad mission. We need uh, time and money to do all these studies and, and try to assess the risk. I'll just add that that's a very advanced question. We're very basic right now. We, we, we have a lot of work to do to get to the point where we can really look at these interactions. That's a really interesting EJ community question as well, because the community that you're talking about and others are like you very different than, say, Salesboro, for example, other questions you can start to search for that community. So I think that's a great point. Do you have another question? Someone? Yeah, so um, my name is Milana, also with Iron Bar Community Corporation. Um, so this sort of had me thinking about uh, water filters and if we should even be using water filters and to what extent can we filter out plastic? Have you noticed how all the water filters are made out of plastic? <laughs> and masks. And masks. And so you might be saving yourself a few milligrams of plastic by putting, you know, hundreds of grams of plastic into the world. So, you know, I, 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 the, the famous Chief Seattle quote is, uh, you know, we, we do not own the land we're borrowing from our grandchildren. Um, I, I, I know that people are worried about what they can do to avoid this but it seems like all our solutions make it worse. So. And this is more kind of, I don't know if we're going to go into solutions, but uh, we see like referral patients and a lot of anxious patients. Uh, is there anything that you do like on a personal level that maybe it's not evidence-based or anything that's evidence-based to kind of uh, potentially reduce health effects? So I guess I'll start on this one. So I, I understand that question and I understand the point from your um, from your patients as well because well we're all scientists, we're all people at the same time, right? We go home, we have families, we have to make the same decisions and choices individually. So while I appreciate that the amount of plastic that might be in a water bottle already, for example, is going to be much less than what's in the landfill and what's still, what's still coming down the road, I guess. But I think there's also a lot of comfort in, in any personal decision and personal um, handle you can have for yourself. So two answers then. So one, trying to limit those plastic exposures, right? Reusable water bottles. Um, not be heating in, in plastic and microwaves. I saw the article about black plastic earlier this week, so that's a whole separate conversation. Um, but anything that gives you a little bit of that personal control just inherently kind of makes you feel a little bit better about it. And then talking to some of the environmental justice individuals and some of the advocates and things like that, anything that we can do to encourage policy change as well. So once we stop using some of these items, that will actually be the most encouraging thing to be able to get companies to change. And once we have those conversations publicly, that will encourage change by default. Coca-Cola, I know this has already changed how they handle their plastic bottles. They're no longer in the plastic rings, but they're in the cardboard instead. So 
I think that it might be a drop in the bucket from a whole what you're being exposed to thing, but I think giving people some of that personal control between making those choices and then engaging, as Senator Smith said, in some of those policy changes, just indicating the displeasure, um, just gives people a, a feeling of a little bit of control over so much chaos around them. Well, I, I can say this. Actually, I did a, a human experiment <laughs> with my team and myself. Um, <laughs> uh, we try uh, to stay away from any plastics and see how many days we can last. I lasted two days. Uh, I know it lasted a little longer. It, it, we are all addicted to plastic. It's impossible to reuse the use. I mean, we cannot go back to storage. Unfortunately, we have to use plastic. I think the trick is. If all of us reduce the use, increase a little bit, and do a little bit more recycling and reuse, and if we convince the industry and politicians to also start with these single-use plastics, which fortunately they will end up in the landfills, I think we can make it. Uh, but changing human behavior is, uh, and habits, it's, it's not really an easy thing to do, and it takes time. So we need to educate people. Maybe we should put some training programs, um, focusing on certain groups that they, they use a lot of plastics, like agriculture, farmers are using a lot of plastics, and, and most of those are single use plastics, and convince politicians to um, put incentives out there for people and work with the industry. I think there are some good industries there. I mean, we saw some really bad examples today, um, but there are some good industries that they're trying to. Uh, they feel the pressure and they're trying to put uh, biodegradable materials out there um, for good packaging and other things. So I, I think it's something that we need to all contribute to it. So I, I will offer a, a, not necessarily a counter viewpoint, but another observation. At UHSI, we try to be environmentally conscious and we're a little bit quote unquote forward thinking and replacing the, the water fountains with bottle filling stations. And I really thought the first one that we did, we were doing much more for PR than reality. 875 fills in the first month. So we are changing the way we do things, okay? It's gonna take time. As Phil said, you know, you, you make it two days, three days, whatever. But we are changing our consumption and we're changing habits and you know you see a bottle on the table here that's not plastic they're common now so i'd like i'd like to think that we're we're moving in the right direction so along those lines uh, i necessarily told you but we had the group that did the bottled water study with us and those collaborators were interested in tap water and those kinds of things so we were asking jersey to provide some from our lab so we provided some I had to live within the Trenton Waterworks district, so we provided some from my house, and then we also took some directly from some of the water filters that Brian's uh, talking about. And if you live in the New York area, you know how much they pride themselves on the cleanliness of New York City water. So the preliminary results, which is all I have to go on at the moment, is that there were significantly more particles. I can't say they were micro nanoplastics, but significantly more particles in the New York City water than there were in either of the New Jersey waters, which being somebody who moved to the state of New Jersey made me very, very excited that being from New York, upstate New York, made me very, very excited that we actually had cleaner water out of this experiment. So maybe we're going to So I two, I saw one question here and I've got one over there. So um, hi, I'm Gina Moreno. Um, I work with Dr. Stapleton. Um, and sometimes uh, I've been doing well, I've been doing micro nanoplastic research for some time, and I understand that uh, maybe this is not popular thought pattern, but um, it's a we understand micro nanoplastics as a mixture, and that we need to evaluate them as a mixture. And I think that that's extremely valid because that's what exists uh, in our environment. But I think it's important to also take into account that plastic is an umbrella term for multiple different 
polymers. It's, they're all, they all come from monomers that are very differently chemically structured. And, you know, you were asking uh, what, what can we tell communities. I think in the science world also, this is such a tremendous mountain to tackle. But I think we need to individually vet different plastics and eliminate certain plastics that are more toxic, whether they are in a higher concentration or lesser, but making efforts to remove from those mixtures certain polymers that are more deleterious than others. That's just, um, maybe you guys can talk about your thoughts on moving research forward and what that looks like. I just had a thought related to you know the, these different polymers. It, as we've published our results, where we talk about sort of the cumulative amounts of polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, polypropylene, uh, we get attacked uh, from Dow Chemical. They want to see our data. They ask us about our methods. It's, it's old hat. I, I've I've done tobacco research in the past, and I, I get it. But it's been funny that um, you know the PVC lobby reached out. And, and, and it was very very funny that they wanted to selectively criticize just the work we did with PVC, as if to throw all the other polymers under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> PVC is totally safe. So it's all the other thing, guys. You got to watch out for it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I think there is a lot of room, especially for food packaging and some area that we have a kind of research projects. Uh, on these biopolymers, these nature-derived polymers like cellulose, cows, and some of the like, uh, they can be a good subsidy. And uh, you know, they have good properties, and it's always a cost, <laughs> which unfortunately plastics are really, really cheap. So, and, and it's always a question who's going to pay the extra few cents or I mean, 10 cents or whatever the cost is. And it's, uh, is it the industry? Um, is the consumers? But I think now all of us as consumers, we are mighty willing to share a little bit of that cost. So again, we, we clean the air, we breathe dramatically. If you go back in the 80s, the air pollution was really bad everywhere. Uh, we clean it. So we can clean this mess. We have the technology to do that. It's, the, the question is, you know, what are the other implications? And, you know, we have. Exxon Mobil and all these industries that are making millions of dollars for making plastics. So it's, it's, it's not a matter of uh, technology or us as a society to deal with this. We know how to manage extremely uh, toxic chemicals, uh, kind of batteries. We do an amazing job uh, collecting them, recycling them, and protecting all of us. We can, uh, so the thing is, you know, how can we really balance and, and, and put our act together so we can really this uh, I, I am optimistic. I think um, we, we can reduce the unmanaged plastic pollution, um, which I think in the US we're, we're not doing totally bad in terms of unmanaged plastic pollution. I mean, there are some numbers out there um, compared to uh, low income countries that uh, the unmanaged uh, plastic pollution is 20 times higher than what we have here in the US. So um, <coughs> it's about 50, 60 million uh, metric tons per year and managed plastic pollution. And this is what is going to end up in open um, fires or in uh, not interstellar environments and then from there can pollute everything. 50, 60 million tons. In the United States, around 2, 3 million metric tons. Um, so we're, we're, we're really doing extremely well compared to other countries. And I think we can do better. And the thing is, we can't just ship our plastics to, to China. Actually, China just thought uh, buying um, a plastic from us. So, I, I, so it's a question of who's going to buy all the plastic from the United States and where we're going to it. Also, burning plastics. I, I'm not against burning plastics. Actually, we published quite a few papers that the uh, incinerated plastics can really cause harm. Um, so we can put pressure on, on, on regulators to regulate really uh, the same way we regulate it for, for, for other energy uh, generating facilities and municipal waste incinerate, which is not the case. Um, so we can, there are things we can do. Um, 
if we uh, inform the people and the, the regulators and Thank you, Madam President. We've got a question over here. I saw my hand on the other side of the room. Um, my name is Teresa Rivera. I'm the Executive Director of Lazos America Unida, which is this Mexican American organization in the state of New Jersey. And as a Native American woman, I grew up with my grandmother, natural medicine, grandmother saying, you know, protect Mother Earth, uh, take care of water, etc. And I think it was very important for us. To now talking about uh, uh, what's going on, how we can build partnerships, how we can communicate between science and words, which is so fancy sometimes for us to understand, and then also how we can bring the voice of uh, indigenous population of common people, you know, we're not scientists, but we want to collaborate with you. And I was trying to get into a seed grant to create that bridge and start hearing about the great indigenous population that work here in the university in the farms because they go in the food. They speak other languages, mystic, I'm mystic. So it's mystic, stuff of the other languages, right? So but how we can build that connection, it was so hard to find a professor willing to collaborate with us and to apply for this grant or start talking about the way that we can communicate uh, all these findings, all this research into common words that people can understand. So uh, I will leave my phone number and everything, but I will, I'm saying like right now, just October 12th past, Native American Day, Indigenous People Day. So I think it's very important to to understand the cosmovision of Native Americans into all this whole concept of what we're talking about. Uh, but also I think the diaspora, the different communities that live in New Jersey, and, and how these scientific, scientific findings and, and what they are doing can be transformed into common words and actions that we all can work together to ensure that the future can be better than we're talking right now. Because I think the time passes very fast. The things that the research is done, but we gotta wait three, four, four years until you finally analyze it. But meanwhile, what we can do together to ensure that that communication, that, that gap is met. Thank you. exact direction that I would like to go in, in the remainder of the time in the conversation. So can I ask, with all due respect, can we put a pin in it for just a moment? Because I think that's going to be a very long, not long conversation, but I think that's going to be a very engaging conversation. And I know there are two, I think, shorter questions, and I would really like to come back to that. Amen. That is really the whole crux of what we need to do. My name is Cindy Ziff. I'm Executive Director of Clean Ocean Action. And I was just curious, um, the scientists in the room, um, plastic in the ocean, I know, has a tendency of attracting other contaminants um, to it, kind of creating these amalgamations of gunk and all kind of poly something connected. They tend to want to find one another, interact to one another. And I'm just curious if that is happening um, in the body, um, in us, and, and in critters, and in other things. Um, and what happens when, you know, we get, when we eat those combos, those little sandwiches? Great question. I'm going to hand it over to Matt since he's done. Oh, maybe not. Oh. <laughs> but he had all the human work, so that was a good question. Oh, yeah, it is a good question. Um, there, there's a few hints. Uh, Andrew West at Duke published uh, about three, almost a year ago uh, a new paper where they looked at a specific type of nanoplastics uh, that carried a negative charge. I mean, we know how plastics can have a static charge on them. But what he found was that they could be a seed for aggregation of a protein called synuclein. Synuclein is an essential component of the plaques that build up in our brain Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. It was all in vitro, it was cellular based, but it, it, it proved an important point that the, the plastics could themselves, as you say, bring things together in a way that is like uh, inconsistent with healthy operations in the brain. Um, and I, to your point, I'm, I'm trying, 
<laughs> I'm trying not to say the words. Uh, the, the other thought is there's a number of autoimmune diseases that are on the rise in our communities, like multiple sclerosis and things like that, and why, we have no idea. So, so it, brings, it brings out this idea that there could be modifications or complexes of proteins that are not normally going to occur in the body because of these, uh, the, these panoplastics. Is there a research happening? Yeah, yeah, I mean, slowly. <laughs> Slowly. Yeah, okay. I think I mentioned we have this USDA funded project. Um, we're looking on how environmental pollutants that they are out there, they interact with plastics that they are out there, especially in my plastics. Uh, we have two papers under review right now uh, on this subject and what happened uh, in terms of the delivery of these other pollutants, not just the, the plastics themselves that they can become successful. So uh, I'll give you a hint. Uh, for instance, arsenic and boscalic. Arsenic is a heavy metal which is, you can find in, in drinking water. Uh, boscalic is, is, is a pesticide widely used in, in agriculture and it's, it's in your site. I mean, pretty much uh, it's everywhere. So the presence of iron plastics, not only uh, the, the sorb side of things on your surface, they can really increase the bioavailability of these other pollutants in your body because they make the gut linear and everything that goes into your, into your gut they will, uh, uh, they will leak through in higher amounts. So um, there are also papers out there leaking um, bacteria and other things that are on these plastics and biofilms of, of uh, microorganisms and they can be delivered. So there is a growing research on this and it can also disturb the microbiome and we know that it's a link between the gut and uh, microbiome and the human brain. So, so uh, imagine any that's point to these kind of uh, potential hazards. Another question here? Thank you. I'm Chanel Shaw and I'm from the New Jersey Public Health Environmental Laboratories. And my question is for all the researchers. So for many of you, you observe microplastics in the context of the before effects or the after effects in the sense of um, Dr. Kemp and you did studies on electromicroscopy such as TEM and REM to look at the actual microplastics melting. And for you, Dr. Stapleton, you did observe the maternal effects and also the infant, um, the fetal effects and you're trying to bridge the gap in the placenta. Um, I want to ask, has anyone considered looking at the fluorescence in living tissues? Like for example, in animal studies to see, like have a binding effect between the fluorescence to those microplastics and then being able to actually visualize it as it's like crossing through or anything like that, something similar? Um, I, I have one, uh, my, uh, I, I think I mentioned Eliana Hayek is a uh, scientist in our group. She's been doing a lot of our, our electron microscopy, but she's proposing one of these, these IVIS studies where you can uh, you know, expose a mouse to uh, fluorescent nanoplastics and then put them in a very, very, very dark chamber and look at use use a very uh, sensitive detector for, for light. Uh, so she's proposing to do that, uh, and it's a neat idea because then you'll be able to look dynamically at the, the movement of the plastics through the body, through the brain. And so so it's, a, it's a good idea. When I presented the work on the placenta and showing how you put it in the uterine artery in the top and then kind of tracked how it went across and tracked how it went down, kind of like right, right before that all on the end of crap plastics, we used a fluorescent labeled plastic, a fluorescent labeled you know, polystyrene. So really speaking to your concept of that using that fluorescence to, to identify them, but I think you're also adding kind of a fluorescent <coughs> finding to see how well they're interacting as well within those human tissues. And I haven't seen that in vivo in a whole animal or in a whole human tissue, but I think there's some work being done uh, for those uh, toxicophysicokinetics, pharmacokinetics in, uh, in vitro that I've seen some of those studies. So at this point, I'm going to pause just before we get ready for the um, solutions, but while we're getting ready for that component, that panel, I'd really like to come back to this question. And I think a lot of my answer to that question is changing changing the way this 
last 45 minutes have gone of being asked questions to the scientists. And I, as a scientist, have a question that I think leads into the EJ community as well of, I think you also identified some of the needs, but that was going to be my primary question. What are the needs that those EJ communities have or want from us on the other side? Basically, we're doing all of this work, but not only does it need to be able to be disseminated, it needs to be clear of how to communicate that to communities, but what other outcomes can actually help those communities be assessed well? And as a leader, we have the Center, um, the Center for Environmental Exposure and Disease, which is part of the UHSI group, does have pilot funds available just for this purpose to join some of those communities. And so one project I had in mind, especially after your question in the corner, um, was really about the different types of polymers within each of these EJ communities at the same time. As I mentioned, the issues that are in Elizabeth and in Linden or in Newark might be different than those that are in Paulsburg or in or something more along the Delaware. So is there a disparity there or what else? How can we help? I guess that's my every, every Friday we have exposure questions. Uh, you know, uh, so basically, the answer that I would have to that question is you know, these PhDs, they've forgotten more than I'll ever know about uh, most of the stuff that they study. Um, but uh, a lot of our training as physicians is how to translate all that stuff to what matters for everyday people. So you know, whether that's communicating how a lot of prostatectomy is going to go, what's important about it, what's going to be not important about it. Or sort of the people you want to ask, like, okay, do I need to care about this? <laughs> um, that's sort of what we do. And so every Friday, uh, you know, we allow patients to come in and schedule an appointment with us where we'll go over their entire health history, basically the whole history of their life. Most of these people can write, write their memoir uh, by the time we're done taking their history and sort of go through what's probably worth paying attention to, what might not be worth paying attention to. Uh, based on what we know right now. Um, a lot of times we say things like, I don't know, uh, because we still don't know a lot. Um, but um, you know, usually there's some reasonable common sense things we can offer people as suggestions, um, and we're usually pretty happy with those. So you know, if you or anyone in the community ever has a question, you know, just make an appointment with us. I would say translating all of that stuff into plain everyday speech uh, and picking and choosing what really and truly matters, um, you know, as a reflection of um, what we uh, uh, together uh, establish our priorities, right? Um, so we don't just decide what's important, what's not. We have a conversation and then figure out what we both agree is or isn't important and needs to be prioritized. Go through, figure out, okay. Well, what do we need to pay attention to? What's maybe not as concerning? Uh, that is a difficult task, but that's what we try to do every Friday. So um, I would say, you know, make an appointment with us. Hello, Oriana again from New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, and thank you, Dr. Keith, for this question, because this is, I guess, what I've been thinking about today in terms of how how do we bring all of this research down to the community level? Um, but I also think it would be really helpful to have researchers. There's so many existing community meetings that happen, um, like the clinics or you know even Shirelle or ICC that hold you know their own regular meetings. And I think it would be really beneficial to have researchers just spend some time at understand how how to break down the language. What are the need to build the relationships with the community? Um, I think in particular for EJ communities, we do not want to hear the false solution of burning plastics. Um, that is not an option for us, right? Like if we know it's not good to burn our trash, we are hearing what happens when these trains derail and there's huge fires and what you know comes out of that and how it's bad for our bodies. The solution is not to burn the plastics. That is not an option for us, um, especially when we have all of these you know, the cumulative impacts that Vanessa is talking about from everything else that's impacting our air, but having those very real conversations with community members, understanding what do you see as those solutions, how do we move forward, how do we help 
um, you know, drive the conversation with our data, with our research, the access that y'all have as, as researchers, I think could be really um, beneficial to just supplementing the work that's happening on the ground and making sure that the solutions that are being recommended actually align with what communities need. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, really well said and a really good point. And I think, I guess, I would like one more thing and a little bit of solutions for that. But the other half of that question then is I've heard a lot of, I guess, top down information. How do we take our research and distill it to community levels? And, and that's one direction. I think that's important to be able to disseminate that information to make it clear, to make it understandable, all of those components. But I also think there's the other half of what the concerns are in the community and how we as researchers can not only understand, tell you what we've learned, but also set those experiments up to give you the most information that you need that would be actually beneficial. And I think that speaks to that point earlier of, I don't want to wait four years to find out about one very specific thing that happened in that. So I, I can respect that. I totally understand where you're coming from. So I think that's where some of those uh, center pilot funds are important. And thank you very much for the invitation as well to visit those community engagement opportunities. So we'll definitely uh, be in touch through the center and through the community engagement board. Other ideas of how to have that bottom up conversation as well. And then we'll move to solutions. I'm just thinking of, of what Rob did in the Ironbound when he, when he where are you? There you are. <laughs> Look, you were over there. When you presented at that press conference the words of the healthcare providers and scientists who were opposing the PVSC gas plan, you said it to activists, to community residents in a way that we could understand it. The letter that you signed, 136 of you signed, that went to the DEP and to the governor was clear. It was understandable. It was it was something we can use. I use your document all the time in ongoing fights. So I think we have a lot to learn from you in in terms of how we can work together and really communicate with each other. And we need we activists and community residents need the the science. We need the science, and you need our issues. We, we, you know, so it's 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 really important the issue that was raised here. I think it's critically important that we work together and figure out how to communicate best and how to work together. Great. Thank you. All. Thank you all very much for a very interactive session. So Carrie asked how many questions I had before I started, and my answer was zero. So I'm really thankful for this open conversation between the groups. So thank you, and I think we'll move on to the solution panel. Okay, so. So why don't we have our uh, panelists uh, come up for the uh, solutions panel?